good. Okay, uh, a word of prayer before we begin today. Um, would you join me, please, by bowing your heads? Heavenly Father, we come before you today rejoicing in the privilege that it is to stand in your presence and to be reminded of your favor and your, your good opinion of us in the gospel. Pray, Lord, that you would lighten our hearts with this good news and that you would enable us today and this week and the rest of the year and throughout our lives to walk in the joy and peace that comes from knowing that we are your children indeed. We pray as we open your word together and discuss matters weighty that you would be among us and that you would uh, allow us to participate in these conversations with that same joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So today I want to talk about the issue of church membership for the last time. Uh, I planned a four-message tour of the subject, and this coincides in our little calendar with the, um, the day that we're, we're collecting uh, signed statements of, of church membership from the congregation. So uh, see me afterwards if you are interested, uh, especially after you hear what I have to say today, if you've been dissuaded. Um, and you want to withdraw, you come and get me and I'll give you a piece of paper back. <laughs> um, just to quick, quickly summarize where we've come so far. This is message number four on the subject of church membership. And I just want to review real quickly. The, the first message, uh, we talked about the, the ministry of the body to itself in New Testament Christianity. And I jumped off from a passage in John where Jesus gives the example of washing one another's feet. And we talked about how the, the member of the body of Christ functions in the body by washing his neighbor's feet, washing his brother's feet. And we talked about how we're to follow Christ's example of that by, by starting with the identity that we have in him and having that give us the freedom to minister to each other in weakness rather than in strength, to take the lower place and to participate in fellowship that way. And in the second message, we talked about how the, the body, the organic relationship of joints and members in a body, an organic physical body, is a good analogy for the life of the church ministering to itself. Each person ministering to the other people and supplying the needs of the body like joints in a physical body. And in particular, we looked at a passage that said the way that we do that is that we speak the truth to one another in love. That the ministry of the gospel actually happens between us as we hear the word preached and we see the needs around us, not only, not only physical, but also spiritual. We minister to the gospel, minister the gospel to one another by speaking the truth to one another in love. And then last time, uh, we talked about the, the administrative structure of the church. And I emphasize the fact that in this particular expression of the body of Christ, we choose our own leaders. We brought up the subject of membership vis-a-vis -vis leadership. And we say, here in this, in this congregation, we follow a congregational model where the members of the church are actually participants in choosing their leaders. And then on the one hand, they choose them. And on the other hand, they obey and submit to them. And we alluded to the, the subject of obey and submit just a little bit at the end. And that's the thing I want to talk about a little bit more today as we wrap up the subject of church membership. But before I jump in, let me just say this. The four messages that we're talking about sort of divide neatly up into two groups. One of them having to do with the ministry of the body to itself. And I, I use this sort of hand signal the first time. I said that sort of happens this way among the members of the congregation. East and west, you might say. And then when we talk about government, we talk about choosing our leaders and obeying and submitting to our leaders, then we're talking about a relationship that's sort of north and south. If I use the geography of the room that we're sitting in as an example, right? There's a, there's a relationship that exists this way between the members of the church and the leadership of the church that has to do with a certain set of issues, a north-south relationship. And I want to distinguish those two things as we go forward today. The east-west relationship whereby all of us are sitting side by side, me included, the elders and deacons included, sitting side by side as members of the body of Christ, ministering to each other by the Holy Spirit, washing each other's feet, speaking the truth to one another in the world, east to west. And then I also want to talk about the north-south relationship we have with each other as members of the church on the one hand and leaders of the church who are A, called, and B, elected on the other hand. 
And when we come to the issue of membership, we're talking about this north-south relationship. That's what I want to talk about today. And I want, to, I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter, uh, sorry, chapter 13 with me for just a moment. Let me read Hebrews 13, 17 to you to get started. This is Hebrews guy, as we know from our recent tour of Hebrews, talking about the application of the gospel in the church. And he says this, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. This passage is explicit about the existence of leaders and members in a church, and there's also a lot of implicit meaning in it that it would do well for us to discuss and suss out. The first thing comes to me in the form of a question. What is it that the member of a church, the one to whom the Hebrews guy is speaking here in chapter 13, what is it that such a member agrees to submit to? What is it that he is being exhorted to obey? Obey your leaders, Hebrews guy says. A church member should ask the question, in what? What are the conditions under which I must obey? On what subjects must I obey? Another way to put this very important question is, what does the leader who's being assumed and named in this verse, agree to command. Hebrews guys say, obey your leaders when they say what? Obey your leaders when they address what subject? Do you obey your leaders if they are leaders in your church when they say what TV channel you can watch? Do you obey your leaders and do whatever they say when they talk about the yard work they need done on their place? Maybe. Is the New Testament explicit? On what subject does the elder, the church leader, who has been duly elected and appointed and called, speak with authority? On what subject does he speak with authority? This is very, very important. Very important for the members of a church to be clear on so they can feel safe in electing someone and promising to submit to him and equally important for the leader so that he can circumscribe his activities and understand his role and his sphere of God-given authority correctly. And so what I want to do today is in one word, in one sentence, answer that question. On what subject do the elders and the leadership of our church speak with authority? The answer is this. We speak with authority about the gospel. We speak with authority, having been called and appointed and elected on the terms and conditions of the economy of grace that is revealed to us in the scriptures. We speak with authority on sound doctrine. We speak with authority on good theology, on the articles of our faith. We speak with authority, with authority on how the scriptures present the good news about Jesus Christ and what it saves us from and the terms on which we are eligible for it. And I want to say something else very important. It is on this subject alone that we speak with authority. It's on this subject alone that we speak with authority. The world is overfull, in my estimation, with church leaders who read a passage like this and say, well, 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 there's authority. Let's go to wielding. There's a membership statement that obliges the member to agree to obey and submit. Let's give them some stuff to obey and submit to. I mentioned already that 
comical, cartoonish, uh, extreme example of this. My yard needs mowing. All I got to do is tell a church member to come mow it. I believe that the New Testament circumscribes the authority of church members very, very narrowly. And if you read all the passages in the New Testament that address the issue of church discipline, for example, that address the issue of protecting the flock, that refer to the subject of Hebrews 13, giving account for this, the care of souls, the vast majority of them have to do with protecting sound doctrine. The vast majority of them have to do with the leader of the congregation saying, that is the gospel and that is not. And speaking with the authority of God because the leaders have been called and appointed to that position. And so what I want to do is present the ministry of our little congregation as we consider whether to formally join as a ministry of preaching. This is the way I put it last week of proclaiming and explaining and defending the gospel of Jesus Christ as it is given to us in, in the scriptures. Proclaiming, explaining, and defending the gospel of Jesus Christ from all variations, from all human twistings and turnings, as Paul calls them. We'll get into that, into what that means as we go along, but I want to say that up front. This is the answer to the question, on what subject does the elder, does the church leader speak with authority? On what subject is the member obliging himself to obey and submit? And so let me talk about obey and submit a little bit more in this context then. What does it mean? To obey and submit to your elders. Let me read Hebrews 13 again. Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Obey and submit to your leaders for they're keeping watch over your souls. In a nutshell, here's the answer as we present it here. In order to be a member in good standing, to function as a member of our congregation, you have to embrace the presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we proclaim. And you have to say, I agree to submit to it, to the proclamation and the explanation and the defense of the gospel that's going on here. But in two words, let me just summarize the duty of the church member. I'll put it in Martin Luther's words. I'll put it in the words of the reformers that we revere here at Christ Reformed Church. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. Because here's the kernel of our presentation. On the one hand, the eternal, unchangeable, perfect law of God, the word of God by which he created the world and set it spinning in its place, the rules by which it runs, physical and moral and spiritual and otherwise, bind you permanently to a covenant of works the law of God is very specific. It demands obedience and indeed perfect obedience and threatens judgment and damnation. And we embrace this. This is word one of our presentation of the gospel. When the law says thou shalt not commit adultery, it means a whole lot more than that. And it binds you in your activities, in your thoughts, in the inclinations of your hearts and threatens judgment from a holy, righteous God at every moment. We proclaim this with authority. This is the word of God. Word number two, the gospel of Jesus Christ forgives us of our sin, sets us free from the condemnation of the law, in exchange for nothing but the grace of God in Christ, whose blood covers our transgression, not just the transgression of our hands, but the transgression of our minds and hearts. Adulterers all. Because of the blood of Jesus, we stand pure and clean in the sight of God. This is word two of the gospel. And it comes with a bullet because we double down and we say there is nothing the sinner can do pre or post salvation 
to earn or deserve or be worthy of this grace. There is nothing he can do to be, to be worthy of this grace. He presents in the, in the transaction of the gospel only his sin. And he clings to Jesus alone for deliverance. And that deliverance is offered every day in the sacrament, in the preaching of the word, in the fellowship of the believers. Experience of that deliverance is offered every day to the repentant sinner. Membership involves accepting and embracing those terms. Obeying that presentation of the gospel and submitting to it. it. Sounds pretty easy, right? Maybe you've never tried it. The hardest thing in the world to do is to say in the midst of that sin whereby you are trying to make a name for yourself, in the midst of that sin whereby you are trying to be good enough and carve out a place for your own identity, in the midst of that sin, Say, God, have mercy on me. I'm running in the wrong direction. Please, please forgive. I claim Jesus' blood alone. That is the hard work of Christianity in a nutshell. And the member embraces and obeys and submits to those difficult terms in his mind and in his heart, and importantly, in his words. There's always a barb in it. On the one hand, it's very easy. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. But as we walk together in membership in a body, those high-minded ideals get feet on them. Because you, as members of a congregation, have chosen and appointed men to watch over your souls. You've chosen men who will proclaim the good news to you in their own voices, in their own idioms, from their own experience, from their own training. And now you agree to hear it from them and to say what they say about it. This is the rub. You've got to be comfortable enough with the presentation of the gospel as it's coming to you to say, I will say what the leadership of my church says about the terms of the gospel. In Christ Reformed Church, this is how we put it. This is how we interpret Hebrews 13. This is how we interpret 1 Corinthians 5. I'm not saying that every word out of my mouth is the only possible interpretation of the scriptures and that there's no room for discussion. But I am saying that there is a tacit, not even tacit, an explicit agreement between us that the presentation of the gospel that goes forth from this pulpit is the one we're working with. Membership calls you to move to the appropriate place on the spectrum between arrogant autonomy, all that's necessary is a Christian and his Bible, walking alone in the woods, and nobody can tell me what the Bible says, I got eyes, I can read it for myself. The appropriate place on the spectrum between arrogant autonomy on the one hand and mindless, unthinking obedience. The terms of the faith are in Latin. And I don't read Latin, but it doesn't matter because they've done what they need to do with the bread. And as long as that guy does it, I'm good. There's an appropriate place on that spectrum that we are looking for. So I'm trying to define and describe to you today. Submission in the heart and in the head to somebody else's explanation of the gospel is what it means to obey and submit to the leaders that God has put in your congregation. And I say this with great fear and trepidation, by the way, because I am mindful as I speak these words of my own inadequacy to proclaim and explain and defend the gospel. One of the reasons that I thoroughly support the adoption of a creed for our congregation, a reformed creed that sets out the essentials of the Christian faith, that exegetes the scriptures for us, 
is the product of long discussion by trained theologians whose hearts are aflame with the gospel of grace. Is that no matter how many elders we gather in this congregation, we're not going to be as smart as we need to be in order to come up with the right answer on every gospel question. It's one of the reasons that we have adopted a creed, adopted a Reformation creed that you can go read and say, ah, at Christ Reformed Church, we believe in the sovereignty of God. And the, these are the scriptural bases for that principle. Does that sound a little narrow, that description of church leadership and spiritual authority? I mean, when I think about it, when I read the New Testament, it looks to me like the leaders of a church are weighing in on all manner of subjects. In fact, if you wouldn't mind turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I want to see if I can dig myself a hole. If I can dig myself a hole and then get out of it, I will consider this little discussion a success. That will let you be the judge. The question is, if the description of church leadership and spiritual authority that you're describing is confined to the definition of the gospel alone, what about the guy that has his father's wife? 1 Corinthians 5, I'm going to read the whole chapter. Paul um, exercised and a little upset with the Corinthians, as he was wont to be, says this, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present, excuse me, with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. By the way, I did not extrapolate there. That's the text, as I see you were following along. That's a text from the Apostle Paul. And we're going to talk about the range of interpretations that verse can be put to over the course of Christian history. But let's continue. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you are really unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter, Paul continues, not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then we would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, if he is guilty of sexual immorality, or greed, or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? It is, not those in, is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. There. How's that for a whole? Sounds for all the world, like Paul is saying, the leaders of a church have the responsibility for the moral policing of egregious sin among the ranks, and their job is to purge, excommunicate, ostracize egregious sinners from the body of Christ. I want to interpret this passage for you as, as a representative of our congregation along the lines of what I've been saying so far, that the job of the church leader is to proclaim, explain, and defend the gospel. And I want to jump back to the end, sorry, the beginning of verse 2, and you are arrogant. And I want to suggest to you that Paul's problem here is not so much with the guy who has committed an egregious act of sexual immorality, but with the leadership of the church that has allowed this thing to go forward without interpreting it in light of the gospel. Paul's beef is not with the guy who has his father's wife, although that's a heinous thing. His beef is with the elders of that congregation in Corinth 
who effectively said, along with the guy who has his father's wife, it's not that big a deal. The law of God doesn't really condemn it. The gospel of Jesus is not really necessary in this situation because we're above all that and you can do whatever you want. The leadership of the church in Corinth failed to proclaim and explain and defend the gospel. The leadership of the church in Corinth failed to say the eternal God who made the world, whose law characterizes his own personality, said, thou shalt not commit adultery. And adulterers stand under his judgment except for one thing only, the blood of Jesus that comes to repentant sinners. The church in Corinth should have said that, and instead they arrogantly assumed the prerogative of deciding what is wrong and what is right. And they allowed this guy to participate in transgressing the law of God openly without defending the gospel in that situation. Your boasting, he says in verse 6, is not good. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Look, remember the gospel. You forgot the gospel. The gospel is the sacrifice of Christ once and for all comes to sinners. That blood is shed for sin. Without sin, there is no gospel. Without egregious transgression of the holy law of God, there is no need for the blood of Jesus. Leadership of the church has got to present them both and must confront lawlessness. If the leadership of the church does not confront lawlessness, how will it preach the gospel effectively? It cannot. The gospel preacher must first say, he must first pick a sin. He must first pick a law and say God's character and his spoken word requires this. And we must all say together what we said a minute ago, holy, holy God, holy and mighty, have mercy on us. For we have not lived as we ought. We do not love you with all our hearts and all our souls and all our minds. We do not love our neighbors as ourselves. We are guilty before the law. Why do I say that the guy's egregious sin in 1 Corinthians 5.1 is not really the issue? It's because the having your father's wife is just a really, really colorful, extreme example of every single sin ever. Of being irritated without cause at your wife, who's just going along being herself. She's got the same personality as she's had the day you married her. And you're irritated without cause because of original sin. It's just a really colorful example of that. And what is the remedy for that? What is the remedy for interpersonal relationship trouble? It's the same remedy for gross, egregious sexual immorality. Repent. Believe the gospel. Say what the leadership of your church says about this problem. The law of God requires perfect obedience in the heart as well as the hands. I am guilty. Lord God, forgive me for Jesus' sake. And then go rejoicing at the blood of Jesus and the way that it covers all your sin. The problem with this guy in 1 Corinthians 5 is that instead of doing that, instead of saying, for example, behold, I am addicted to alcohol. I'm an alcoholic. And I know it's a sin, it's idolatry. I'm trying to save myself with my alcoholism. God, forgive me. And walking away clean and righteous in the sight of God. Instead of doing that, he said, you know what? Alcoholism's not that big a deal. I can live however I want. Gross sexual immorality's not that big a deal. I do not agree with the terms of the gospel as they are being preached here. I don't agree that the law binds me. I don't agree that the things the law forbids are that big a deal. I don't agree that I really need the gospel. That's his problem. If it were any other way than the thief on the cross, wouldn't he get in? Because the only thing he had to recommend to him was, God, forgive me. 
He had no chance to go back and fix it. It's too late for that. God, forgive me. Remember me. Based on your own substance, based on your own power, when you come into your kingdom. Save me by your strength alone. This is the problem in 1 Corinthians 5. And so let me just get to the, the troublesome part. Let's go down to verse 11. I am writing you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler. Not even to eat with such a one. How, how, Andrews, how are you going to get out of this? If a guy calls himself a brother, names the name of Jesus, but it turns out that he's greedy, it looks for all the world, like Paul says, ostracize that dude. You must purge all workers of iniquity from among you. This would be easy to buy if he just confined this list to the bad stuff. If he just said, anybody who's guilty of sexual immorality and calls himself a brother is clearly not a brother, kick him out and ostracize him. Except... The list is just so troublesome because it follows sexual immorality up with greed. You know, greed. A private sin. The one that you can indulge in all day long and not really ever, doesn't really ever show. It's just how you handle your checkbook, maybe, or the decisions you make in business, which may be perfectly legal. Do not even associate with someone who's an idolater. Well, that's troublesome, too by our definition of idolatry that we all pretty well agree on. Anybody who at times worships someone besides God and organizes all the details of his life to serve another God besides Jehovah. If you've never been guilty of that, you're probably lying to yourself. It's more or less universal. A reviler? There may be egregious examples of reviling people, but I revile people in my heart all the time. In fact, in the last 24 hours, I'm guilty of reviling. A drunkard, a swindler. I am writing you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother who does those things. What can it mean? I want to interpret that for you. We can discuss this, but this is what I think it means. I am writing to you not to allow someone into membership in your congregation who does not agree that those things are against the law of God, who does not agree that those kind of behaviors require and demand repentance as transgressions of the eternal law of God. You do not allow anyone into membership who does not agree that those things disqualify you from membership in the kingdom of God, much less in this congregation, unless you cling to the blood of Jesus for saving from their righteous judgment. And I think the prohibition here is not for contact of all kinds, but for membership. I want to link this to the discussion we're having about what it means to be a church member. What it means to be a church member is to say with the leadership of the church, this is the law. This is the gospel. And this is how the gospel redeems us from the curse of the law. These are the things that the law prohibits. These are the things that the gospel saves us from. To join us as a member is to agree with those things. Finally, to disagree, to say, finally, permanently, you got the gospel wrong here, leadership of the church. That's not actually the gospel. That's not actually what the law says. That's not actually what the gospel says. The economy is not what you present it as, is to disqualify yourself. And so this comes across strong, and there's no way around it. It's a strong thing. Because the leadership of any local congregation is tasked by God with watching over the souls of its members. And this is what we propose to do. We propose to be faithful, to proclaim the gospel as a rescue 
from the law of God that will let none escape. To explain how it works. To explain the implications of Jesus' complete work. And to explain it with reference to specific law and transgression as often and as faithfully as we can. And to defend our presentation of that economy with all that is in our power. And in the extremity, to invite those who will not obey and submit to that presentation of the law and the gospel to seek membership somewhere else. That's a tough one. But let me just give you an example real quick. Did you, in fact, look in the mirror this morning and say, Behold, I'm a swindler. Did you, in fact, look in the mirror this morning and say, You know, if I'm telling the truth, I think more highly of myself than I ought. Did you, in fact, look in the mirror today and say, I am a lustful man. I am a greedy, envious man. With nobody looking but just you in the face. Do you, ever, do you ever resist looking in the mirror in the morning? Maybe this is telling too much about myself. <laughs> Sometimes when it sits heavy on my shoulders, I don't want to look in the mirror because the eyes are the window to the soul. And the mirror guy knows as well as I do what's really in there. Why should I look at him? So I brush my teeth this way. <laughs> you ever do that? I'm here to tell you that that guy's telling the truth. You are as guilty as you're afraid you are, and more. None of us knows ourselves. None of us knows himself all the way down to the bottom. Right? We don't know the depth of the sin in our own hearts. But everything that you suspect might be wrong with you is. And it's a moral failing, and it's damnable. We will not soft pedal it here. Greedy idolater, reviler, drunkard, swindler, sexual immorality. This is a fellowship of sinners. We have this as our common ground. And in exchange for repentance, in exchange for a plea for mercy, all of those things are swept away permanently in the blood of Jesus. And God remembers our sin no more. And we are free, whether we feel like it today or not, to wash each other's feet. We are free, whether we feel like it today or not, to speak the truth to one another in love. We are free, whether we feel like it today or not. It's a truth about us. We are free in Jesus to minister the gospel to one another. This is what we will say in our calling and role as leaders in this congregation. And with God's help, we will be faithful not to budge off of it for an inch. And we'll defend it with argument and hopefully with the power of the Holy Spirit from this day forward. If you are interested in signing on to participate in that kind of fellowship, to participate in the north-south relationship whereby we choose our own leaders and agree to obey and submit to them in this way, today's the day turn in a little paper. I wish I could end on this administrative sermon with a little rousing theological point, but maybe I've made it already. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and then we'll discuss. Lord Jesus, thank you for the uncomfortable truth of your word that the gospel divides, that the gospel is what it is, and that an anti-gospel is not the same thing. I pray that you would give us in this little congregation as we go forward by faith in your presence and in your power of, of your Holy Spirit, as you give us the ability to see the gospel clearly, to cling to it with all our hearts. Lord, I pray that you'd help us tell the difference between truth and error when it comes to the demands of your law and the freedom that you offer in Jesus. Be with us, Lord. Guide us into all truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.